thanks everyone for joining, first of all. Um, we're pretty amazed at the number of people that turned up today. Um, and uh, yeah, we just want to welcome everyone. To, so this is the very first webinar from the, from the Mental Health Working Group of the Leibniz PhD Network. And we're really grateful that you're all here and we thank you so much for coming. And we, today we have an amazing and very international lineup of guest speakers today who have been kind enough to voluntarily give up their time to share their insights with us. Um, and we, we, we are very grateful that you're all here today, especially as mental health is just such an important issue in academia um, now that's really getting a lot more attention, um, uh, but often sadly doesn't get talked about enough. Um, and some recent surveys have shown that academics are around five times more likely than uh, the average person to suffer from mental health issues. And under this current circumstances with this corona outbreak, this just makes this issue much more, more salient. And um, under the circumstances, many junior academics are, are struggling with lots of additional issues like social isolation, um, uncertainty about their jobs in a, in, a, in a job environment that's already extremely uncertain um, and there's many other issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so before we go ahead with our first speaker I wanted to uh, pass the microphone to another member of our, uh, of our working group Irina who's going to introduce a bit about our network and a bit about our working group. Irina. Yeah, great. Thanks, Elliot. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen with you. Let's see if that works. Uh, there we go. Looks good. So yeah, my name is Irene Broer. And just like Elliot said, I'm here to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the steering committee of the Leibniz PhD Network and our working group, Mental Health. And just as a quick introduction to those of you who aren't as familiar with us yet, uh, we are a self-organized network representing over 4,000 doctoral researchers uh, within the Leibniz Association. And our purpose is to basically improve the working and education conditions of researchers on the PhD level. And we do that through a series of events, different working groups, and um, yeah, by making political demands. So uh, yeah, most institutes within the Leibniz Association will have a PhD representative or hopefully even two um, that meet every year at our general assembly. And that, that's where we decide basically on our next year's goals and activities. And we also elect a new steering committee each year to lead the network. And it consists of two spokespeople, a treasurer and representatives for each section within the Leibniz Association. So let's see, as mentioned before, today this met webinar is organized by the working group Mental Health. And we're actually quite a new working group. So yeah, we started only a few, few months back. I think we met for the first time at the General Assembly in September. Um, and I think we had our first meeting, was it this year or last year? Not quite sure, but so we're very new. Um, and yeah, our members are Dolly Montano, Elliot Brown, of course, uh, Marcel Rechlitz, Stephanie Do, and myself. And our goal is, I think, in the first place to raise awareness and also improve the mental health conditions for doctoral researchers. And well, we're quite happy to get off to such a good start today. Um, just if you're interested, we've got quite a few other working groups that are currently active within the PhD network. And yeah, that's, it's a big range, so um, you've probably heard of the Leibniz PhD survey um, and uh, we're also working on prevention of power abuse, improving diversity issues, greening our institutes. Yeah, as you can see, um, all these topics are, well, we're trying to improve PhD life in one way or another. So just in case you're interested in getting involved and I can highly recommend it, it's, it's really fun. There are several things you could do. So of course, you could visit our, our website um, or follow us on social media. Uh, another idea is to get in touch with your institute's PhD representatives. They'll probably know how to, how to get in touch with us or any other working groups. 
or if you already seen a, you've already seen a topic that you like, you can of course contact a working group of your interest and immediately join in. So yeah, that was everything from me. Um, yeah, let's get started with the webinar. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot, Irina, for that introduction. Um, so. Just to give you an idea of the structure of today's webinar, um, the first part of our webinar is going to be the talks from our three guest speakers. Um, and they'll be talking for around 20 minutes or less each. Um, and then after the three talks, we'll go into the discussion section of the webinar, where we'll be reading out questions posed by the participants. And then any one of the panelists um, uh, are free to answer um, and we aim to have this discussion part last maybe 20 or 30 minutes um, and aim to be done completely around 12 noon. Um, so in terms of the questions for the participants, um, if I could just direct everyone to the bottom of their screen or the bottom of their window, there's a button for Q&A. Um, where you should be able to open up another window and there you can type in your questions. So um, for all participants, please feel free to type any questions at any point during the webinar. And the idea is that we are going to, um, I'll, I'll read them out at the end. Um, and, um, but if there's any very specific questions for individual speakers and depending on the time, we might try to answer these questions in between the talks, but otherwise, what we do is we'll leave um, most of the questions to the end. And apparently there's also a way to actually vote for each question within that Q&A window. So if you feel like you see a question posed by someone else you think is really important or you would really like to be answered, then I think there's a way that you can, you can, um, you can make a vote. Um, so um, yeah, the chances are we probably won't get through all questions by today, but um, we're hoping that we'll be able to find a way to address other questions at a later time, either through future webinars or maybe through social media. And yeah, so that's about it. Um, so without further ado, um, it's a real honor to introduce Dr. Desiree Dickerson, who is our first speaker. Uh, she is a neuroscientist, a psychologist, and a professional coach. And uh, she provides consulting specifically on academic mental health and well-being. Uh, she's joining us from Spain and she'll be talking about the topic of mental health and well-being resources during the pandemic. And if I could ask all the other speakers um, just to switch off their cameras just so that um, Dr. Dickerson can get the full spotlight and I'll do the same. And I'll pass the microphone over. Thanks very much. Great, Elliot. Thanks for that. And uh, thanks all of you at the Leibniz uh, Mental Health Working Group, first and foremost, for this initiative. I think it's, it's critical that these discussions around mental health and well-being are taking place in our academic community. Um, and certainly, you know, to have such an event right now, I think, can be beneficial to, to many of us during these, shall we say, novel times. Now, as Elliot said, I'm, I'm based in... Um, in, in New Zealand, uh, no, I'm from New Zealand, I'm based in Spain. So I did my PhD in, in New Zealand. I then moved to Austria to do a postdoc at the IST Austria. And then I since left academia and I've been working as a consultant for mental health and wellbeing for academic communities. Um, and look, for, for me at the moment, we're, I'm in Spain and I've been in lockdown for, it's the 27th day, I think today, though it's all a bit of a blur. And uh, we're in an apartment and here the, the restrictions are really significant. So I'm not allowed to leave the house. We're not allowed to leave the house for anything other than food, not for exercise, for anything. Um, I, and we are in an apartment with two small children. So suffice to say, it's been challenging. Um, now, despite sort of working in this field and working in and, and spending my life talking about mental health tools and, and, and well-being tools for people, I have to say that that my mental health and well-being has never been quite so thoroughly tested at this point in time. I, at the beginning of this, I, I saw all of my, all of my, I was sort of heading into a massive period of travel and, and workshops around a lot of universities in Europe and then in, in Australasia as well. And I just saw them cancel one after the other and realized, you know, there would be no traveling and thought, gosh, okay, well, we're going to have kids at home. This is going to be easy. And I've never been so busy in my life. Mental health is obviously important and we are seeing a huge 
uh, people reaching out for it uh, right now and rightly so. And <clears throat> I suppose my situation that, you know, this, there's no real ex escaping it. There's this sort of level of tension in our house that's rather palpable. The noise levels are, and loan are, are really enough to drive you, kind, kind of get you on edge at least, you know. Um, and I'm having to be really militant about managing my, my well-being and my mental health um, and setting up boundaries of what I can and cannot do. I'm having to say no to things that I would otherwise love to do simply because I, I know I can't manage anything more on my plate right now. And I think I'm probably not alone in these, these feelings, these sensations right now. You might not have children at home, but I think either way, the amount of, of cognitive bandwidth, of emotional bandwidth that's being eaten up right now, just processing what's going on in the world is, is enough. And it's unlikely that we're going to be our, our usual productive um, selves just right now. That's a reasonable, probably it's an unreasonable request perhaps right now. Now, the working committee, the steering committee here actually posed us some questions um, to help guide how, how we might speak on these topics. And I actually just really like the question, so I'm going to just answer them directly. Now, the first question that I got was, what's my perspective, in my perspective, do I think that, that the current crisis affects the academic community and particularly doctoral researchers? And, and I think that on the basis of having, having held many discussions, run a bunch of these sort of live conferencing calls um, with people, PhD students, postdocs, early career researchers, graduate officers, even rector's officers. I think we, it's safe to say that this pandemic is, is touching everyone's lives in some way or other, and that there are plenty of postgraduate students struggling right now, and for probably a vast array of, of reasons, right? Many of our student, many of our population, academic population, live far from their homes. Many, many of the students I've been talking to have families that are have either been already hit really hard by this virus already and others that are really fearful of what is still to come. Um, they're not only attempting to manage their own workloads and their own emotional struggles at the moment, but they are stepping up and really trying to provide community support for those back home. Some of them might be exasperated by family or communities or governments that aren't taking this as seriously as they perhaps should be. And that's a huge weight to wear on, on our shoulders, worrying about our family back home. And, um, <clears throat> Students are expressing sort of a full range of emotions from, from, from anxiety to worry, anger and frustration, loneliness, of course, sadness as well. And some are actually really expressing a, a struggle with feeling like a sense of ir irrelevance, like feeling like their work suddenly feels meaningless in this time. Others and many of, of, of us are feeling distracted. They're having real difficulty finding motivation to do any work at all. And they're finding it really difficult to concentrate when they are sitting at their desks. And I, and I think, obviously, those are for the above reasons I've just talked about, but and many, many more. Now, each of the PhD students um, and postdocs, you have a, a unique supervisor as well, who either is or perhaps isn't dealing with, with this crisis um, themselves. Some, of, some students I've talked to haven't, haven't even been reached out to by their PIs uh, since this has all begun. Others have supervisors that are just exemplary and are touching base on a daily basis and making sure that they're helping the students get all, all, all of their needs met. So <clears throat> yes, I think this pandemic is certainly impacting on our academic community in, in a vast variety of ways. And I, and I think it's true that, that in perhaps in true academic style, many of us are feeling guilty. Guilt seems to be a common, a common um, experience within the academic community I've found and that you know, either they're guilty for not working enough right now or they're guilty for working too much and they've got children that they want to be paying attention to or guilty for not contributing more directly to what's happening right now. So yes, I think the academic community is, is feeling the pressure of this right now. Um, the next question was, was how do we check in and, uh, on our students and our colleagues and how do we check in if, uh, to see if they're coping and how they're doing? Now, I actually think that's how I came to be part of this, this panel in the first place. I wrote a piece recently on, on, on just on LinkedIn about offering or trying to offer some very, very simple advice, a cheat sheet, if you will, for, for PIs and supervisors on how to check in with people, how to check in with your people, because my experience and, men, and certainly the experience of many that I, that I work with has been that some of our, some of our leaders, uh, like, like managers in, in industry as well, they operate on a kind of a don't ask, don't tell 
strategy or policy with their people. They don't, they don't 